Thank you very much, Mr. Sweeney. Um, and your, the, the information you have conveyed, uh, I think, is astounding. 14.3 million voters uh, signed up in less than a month, 32,000 electronic voter identification systems, um, and the list goes on. Uh, I am wondering, you did say that, that the, um, the failures in technology uh, were really failures of project management. And I wonder if you might want to elaborate on that. You know, I have two brothers who are pilots, and they will always be the first one to say that it is often not the machine, it is pilot error. So is that, are we talking about people just to know the process? So how, how would you elaborate on this, this failure of project management, if you would? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I would never ascribe anything to pilot error. Okay. <laughs> you must be a pilot. <laughs> um, however, in, in the case of Kenya, for example, they accomplished great things. Their uh, registration system involves a photograph and fingerprints. Those were organized onto machines for the 1,000 voters per polling station. And the voters would then use their thumb on the machine so as to pull up identification. That was great as long as either there was a electricity in the classroom where the polling place was taking place or the batteries worked. Now, batteries are funny things. Sometimes they say they will work for 12 hours, but then they are not completely charged. And sometimes they run out of power because to take a thumbprint is a very large draw on a battery. And so if 1,000 people over the course of a number of hours, the batteries in some cases failed. Now, there was a point where the political process and civil society said, don't continue with the investment in the paper list. Let's completely rely on technology. The election committee, the IEBC was able to make the point that first of all, the paper list was what was the official register of voters as stated in the law. It might not have been as fancy and as glitzy, but it was the official register. And secondly, if, electronic, if electric power or battery power failed, you had the backup. But finally, third, the Election Commission invested seriously in the identification process, so there were actual photo IDs next photographs of every voter next to their name because they had gone through the registration process. And the list was constructed so that it could be used by a polling worker or a series of polling workers over the course of a 12-hour day, be flipped back and forth and not fall apart. Frankly, in my experience, it was one of the best voter booklets I had ever seen. Including and it was here. sitting there as Including the backup. here, right? <laughs> um, one of the best I had ever seen, sir. I, <laughs> okay. Don't choose to revise and extend. Okay. Um, but it, it worked. And so if the electronic system didn't work, they had the official register of voters with photo IDs in a format that allowed every voter to be serviced by those poll workers. Um, that is an example, if you will, of where technology was great when it worked, and it was really impressive to see person after person put their thumbprint down, see their voto ID come up on that computer screen until the battery gave out. Yeah. And so these are some of the issues that you are dealing with. Um, you noted generously in your testimony, in your comments, that IFAS went out and purchased both cell phones as well as SIM cards so as because of the lateness of the procurement uh, by the IEBC on the, phone, on the cellular phones and the distribution of them. Uh, there were logistical issues in getting all of that out to all of the polling stations. And there were training issues where, uh, frankly, I suspect that some of the polling workers did not know how to put the new SIM cards into the old phones, um, which resulted in problems. These, this is all, this is, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, not unforeseen, not a surprise. The Kenyan election law allowed uh, both for a provisional vote system so that you had information for the first three days. That was always considered provisional and not official. And then you had the Election Commission had seven days to go through the process 
of a hand count of all of the materials as they came into Nairobi. That was all anticipated in the law, as was the period of the appeal process and judicial review. And these were all steps forward because of the disaster of 2007. You know, it would appear, and all three of you can back this up one way or the other, that the IEBC had a very capable group of talented leaders who, who knew not only were well trained, but were also situation awareness types that got the job done, um, especially in light of the deadlines. You mentioned numerous political agendas. I'm not sure what that means, but, but um, if you might want to speak to the importance of having very talented people that you saw on the job, um, like at the IBEC, IEBC, I should say, uh, in making this really happen? Because I have met with electoral commissions all over Africa, all over the world, frankly, and some have, leave a lot to be desired. Uh, they are the handmaiden of the ruling party, and they just do whatever the ruling party wants. And when there is a contested election, they, they uh, find more likely, as we saw in, in um, Ethiopia, uh, in favor of what um, the, the ruling party wants. If you could speak to that the talent and, and Mr. Chairman, if I, if I can, first of all, if you looked at the criteria to become appointed a member of the IEBC, there were over 150 candidates considered by the Parliament. They had to produce their police records as to whether or not there were any arrests or liens, their income tax forms, all of their political activity. They had to uh, swear not to run for office, I think, five to seven years after this election. Um, they took, uh, to my way of thinking, the, the, probably the, the most difficult election commission to be a member of is India's, and they took the India standard, which only allows career civil servants who have got an unblemished record after 20 years of service um, to become members of the election commission. They took the Indian standard to a higher threshold. Um, and the amount of disclosure that these candidates for IBC, all of the candidates, had to submit to their parliament for selection was, uh, by any standard, simply amazing. Uh, income tax forms, police forms, academic records, everything. Uh, and then these uh, men and women were selected, and they were dedicated to uh, fulfilling their mission to their country. Um, I know almost all of the IEBC members, having met with uh, them individually and collectively a number of times over the last three years. Uh, it is a tremendous group of very committed public servants who come from all walks of life. There was a chemistry teacher there was from mid-schools. There was a former ambassador to the United States who had been a career public servant. There was uh, a lawyer. There was an accountant. It was a tremendous group of people um, who have committed themselves to uh, Kenya's democracy. Mr. Chairman, I would just add that uh, all the things that my colleague from IFAS just said is true of the Commission. However, this is a political process, and there was a moment when the public confidence in the IABC was lost. Uh, that is during the procurement process. There were accusations made of a number of the members uh, and when the, the State House, uh, our, the equivalent of the White House, intervened, it created a problem. And that problem uh, was uh, difficult to overcome. Uh, we worked with the chairman for uh, at least five years before he was even the chair of the commission. Uh, so in terms of impugning someone's reputation, uh, that, that's not what I'm trying to uh, point out here, because I think that these are well-known public servants. Uh, but in the political process, whether it was true or not, a problem was created because of the procurement issue. The second thing I would add, sir, is that um, while there were these flaws, uh, we still have to look at the progress that has been made in Kenya, a significant progress, a revolutionary constitution, the best, one of the best on the continent. Uh, the, the, besides the uh, constitution itself, the reform of the courts, and, and perhaps the reason that Rilo Odinga went to the courts was because of the confidence people now have and now the devolutionary process. Uh, 47 new states have been created uh, with new uh, assemblies. So while the IEBC's vetting process took place, judges also had to be vetted. Uh, and, and this devolutionary process is very dynamic. It will be difficult uh, for progress to be made in the short term. 
And I think from the aid effectiveness point of view, that's one thing we have to watch. It's the, the short-term pressures of an electoral process versus the long-term sustainable development challenges that, that we face, especially in a country like Kenya that is the hub for security and communications in East Africa. If, if, if what we did was to, uh, good enough to save one life, I, I don't think we should put a, value, a dollar value on it. And I think that, that in this particular case, uh, the Kenyan people are the ones who should be congratulated because they had made up their mind uh, through their various peace campaigns uh, that they were not going to go back to the violence of the past. Mr. Fagan. I'll just speak uh, quickly to this point because I believe my colleagues uh, covered it very well. Um, but I think Chairman Hassan did a good job. You know, I saw him when he was in Nigeria for those elections, observing just like me. So he took his, his role very seriously, went to other African elections to see how other, other institutions were working. And I think that's an important thing for a lot of these uh, chairmen of, the, of these, uh, the, the election commissions to do, is to get to know other elections on the continent. And Nigeria in 2011 was probably one of the best ones he could have, he could have witnessed. Um, as, as Dr. Jennings mentioned, um, prior to the elections, there was controversy. There was a crisis in, in, um, in, in their public image um, because of the, the biometric voter uh, registration uh, procurement issue. Um, they probably could have done a much better job in communicating to people, but I think even in the, in the last period the be between the, 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 the election and the election results, they kept people informed. They told people about their mistakes. They, told, they kept people informed, which was good. Um, but what we think is important, but what the Kenyan people think is much more important, and you have about a 50 percent of the population that probably very much respects the IEBC and its leadership, but maybe slightly, almost 50 percent, that might not. And we have to remember um, that other side of the country. So while they, they, did, they conducted themselves very, very well, we have to remember what the Kenyans think. And, but we also have to remember not just the presidential elections were held. Kenyans um, voted for six, five other elective positions. And there have been, I don't know the numbers, but very few challenges to those, those, uh, to those positions. So all in all, a, I would say a good elections process and a job done well by the IEBC. A lot of lessons learned, um, but a good job. Mr. Fagan, you said in your testimony that um, President Odinga even commented that Kenya could not be run via Skype at The Hague, a reference to the pending ICC trials against Kenyatta and his running mate. Uh, I'm wondering, um, did the U.S. position on that, uh, the warning that was issued earlier on, have any impact? Did it swing it either way? Was it a non-factor? Uh, and people just decided on their own who it is that they wanted to support? You know, I can't speak for Kenyans on, on whether, you know, the, the international community's position um, on, on the presidential candidates impacted their votes. You know, I think, you know, some people will say maybe that emboldened some people to vote more um, because they wanted to say this is a Kenyan election, this is our process, we don't want the interference of the international community. Um, so it's hard to say whether or not um, the, the international community's stance, which was never fully they never fully endorsed one candidate over another, but certainly there were some statements made um, by officials from our government and other EU governments, which you know is probably slightly one candidate over another. Um, just be careful how Kenyans voted um, because of the repercussions that could be made. But those repercussions we don't know yet. Um, both uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta and uh, Vice President Ruto have been cooperating with the ICC, um, and as long as they cooperate. I think that the U.S. government and other governments um, will have to take that into consideration in how they deal with them. Um, when we look at Zimbabwe and we look at the sanctions on those leaders, the U.S. government still deals with those leaders. Obviously, uh, President Mugabe is not allowed in this country. Um, but we still have an ambassador there. We still have an ambassador who has presented his credentials to Mugabe. Um, so there, there are a lot of ways to deal with the Kenyan government. Um, and I think the United States will find ways to do that because it is such an important ally. Finally, the, the role of faith-based um, NGOs in civil society um, in promoting participation as well as nonviolence. And Dr. Jennings, I think your point made about we need to look beyond just the presidential elections 
that breakdown of Jubilee versus the Coalition for Reform and Democracy looks like there are a whole lot of contested elections uh, with, with not an equal but a very credible outcome that people were picking and choosing rather, rather um, you know, effectively. They didn't just go for one side. So on those two things, and finally, how can this experience, uh, Mr. Fagan, you talked about how important it was for some to be at other elections, like in Nigeria, uh, where there were many other Africans, particularly those who are in the queue in this, this year and next, uh, observing and drawing some good lessons learned. And I know, Mr. Swinney, you said there will be an event very soon uh, on lessons learned. Uh, please convey that, to, you know, if you would, to the committee so we could send it out, you know, based on your insights uh, and others as well. Um, but if you could touch on that, then I'll yield to my friend, Ms. Bass. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, we can't forget how polarized this environment was. It was a quite volatile situation. And so any advantage that either of the major contestants could find, they would make use of. Uh, and I, I think, for the record, we should state and, and understand President Obama's statement was very well received. Uh, that it wasn't seen as being controversial at all. Um, there were other statements that people tried to say contradicted President Obama's statement. Uh, and and there was a more of a nationalist tone of, of uh, respect our sovereignty position was taken by a number of the contestants. It's understandable in, in a political situation that is as close as it was, and everyone predicted. And in fact, we thought there would be a runoff. Uh, but the numbers and the, the results prove that it's still a fairly divided country. Uh, let me just say on the faith-based participation, it was massive. And there were calls for peace uh, for more than a year. Uh, it, the calls were so resounding that many people uh, said they had peace fatigue. Um, <laughs> but the, 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 whether it was uh, the, the churches or the mosques or synagogues, uh, everyone was calling for peace. And, and that's what I, I was saying, uh, referring to earlier, that it was the Kenyan people who had determined. Uh, sadly, 19 deaths did take place. But compared to past electoral violence, not only 2007, but for all of the past elections, it's, it's a very tiny uh, amount of, of deaths. The, the, uh, with respect to uh, the, the public, I, I think the role that the media played was significant. There were, people felt like they had clear choices here uh, because of the role of the public debates that took place. And, and they knew what they were voting for. And again, I think the numbers suggest that the society is fairly um, uh, clear about which candidate we wanted to vote for. Under this is something that we may be a bit uncomfortable discussing, and, and that is the, the, the fact of, of ethnic uh, divisions that exist within Kenya. But I think that Mr. Uh, Kenyatta and Mr. Ruto uh, are together in an unlikely coalition uh, and so they should be up to the task of managing the diversity of that country. And I think that's a lesson that, again, is something that can be shared with others in Africa. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just make two or three quick points. Number one, uh, the election commissions in Africa have a history of observing each other's elections. There's a great deal of learning a uh, great deal of shared experiences. Uh, IFAS and others helps facilitate that. We had uh, colleagues from the Liberian Election Commission as part of our, obs uh, as part of our team in, Africa in uh, Kenya. We hosted an evening of the uh, uh, South African, Nigerian, uh, Liberian, and Kenyan election officials uh, before the election so they could compare notes and then follow up afterwards. There were also a number of senior election administrators from a number of countries who were part of either the Commonwealth dele Observation Delegation or the European Union Delegation. Uh, former Chairman Qureshi of India, who was very much a mentor uh, to the Kenyan process, was there as a member of the Commonwealth Delegation. So the, the, within the industry, if you will, there, there was a great number of lessons learned from other experiences that were then finally applied in Kenya, but there's never such a thing as a perfect election. So we know that some of those experiences will then show up 
in trainings and, and conferences in other countries. That is part of the election administration profession. So, so that was very robust both before the Kenyan election. The IEVC members were very involved in learning from other societies and countries, and that was evident in both the uh, evolution and passage of five new election laws as well as other issues throughout the entire process. Um, secondly, the issue that you raised was known to all Kenyan citizens. This was not a secret. Um, it was a matter of public debate. They voted and they elected a team um, that was well, well aware of the, uh, of the uh, questions raised by the ICC. Um, this, is, this is not a secret. Um, so I, and it is up to Kenyans as to how they voted and how those campaigns projected that information out to their voters. And no one was shy about it from what I could see. It was a matter of public debate. Uh, my final point would be that uh, the, we are already working with the Kenyan Election Commission uh, looking at what went wrong, what went right, what we could do better. Some issues are in the law. Some issues were in the process of public procurement. Some issues were in communications. Um, every election commission that is professional uh, takes a look at what happened last month and tries to figure out what best. And today's uh, Kenyan Supreme Court comments on the procurement process, I'm sure, will be part of the lessons learned. Ms. Bass. 